Hi everyone. Apparently, there is nothing better than a good cliffhanger at the end of a TV show to entice viewers to watch the next episode. So you're probably all here wondering what did happen on Easter Island. I warn you, you might find that this second video is a bit more technical than the first. We will present Jared Diamond's famous theory about what happened on Easter Island and then a Ricardo Maltese model of renewable resource use by James Brander and Scott Taylor to add some structure and do some predictions around the story. So archaeologists did discover traces of pollen, which suggests that an ancient palm forest actually existed on the island, but the forest disappeared some centuries ago. This confirms La Perouse suspicion and actually led archaeologists to believe that the ancient islanders may have been responsible for the disappearance of the forest. A famous interpretation of the events was published by Jared Diamond in 2005. I will uh, summarize the story as follows, an ecocide in three acts. The key argument is that to be able to build uh, and transport all of these large statues on the island, there has to have been a large population on Easter Island. So the first Polynesian must have arrived quite early on the island. He estimates at around 400 AD. Shortly after arriving, the islanders probably used the forest for firewood and making canoes. They probably ate fish around the island or in the high seas thanks to their boats. And uh, they probably ate birds that were nesting in the forest. Thanks to the abundance of resources, the population grew quickly and became wealthy, so it was easy for them to meet their subsistence requirements. He estimates that the population must have peaked around uh, the year uh, 1400 AD, AD at around 10,000 individuals. So according to researchers, a reasonable guess for the population maximum is between 7,000 and 20,000 people. Then the relatively high level of wealth left resources and time to devote to activities such as statue carving, which became a frenzy. Moving statues and erecting them must have required lots of wood. The problem is that palm trees grow relatively slowly and they couldn't generate, regenerate fast enough to supply the needs of the islanders. And pollen records suggest that the palm forest must have been entirely gone by 1400 AD. So without the forest, the bird population could not survive. The soil could no longer retain enough water to grow food. Also, wood was no longer available to build canoes or boats. That means that they couldn't fish. But even more, even more tragically, it means that they couldn't escape the island anymore. They had sealed their fate. They were stuck on the island. With resources dwindling, famine must have followed and probably cannibalism and war. This picture is a tool that was found all over the island. Archaeologists speculate it may have been a weapon of war during that time. So it's called a mata. As a side effect of society's breakdown, Moai construction must have stopped uh, because the islander must have stopped worshipping the old statues and even maybe start destroying the existing ones. Jared Diamond has this famous quote, I have often asked myself, what did the Easter Island who cut the, down the last palm tree say while he was doing it? So he says things like jobs, not trees, or technology will find a substitute for wood, or there is no proof that there aren't trees anywhere else. Before Jared Diamond's book, two economists, James Brander and Scott Taylor, have suggested a model to show what must have happened on Easter Island. Their model is based on the Lutka Volterra Predator Pre model. The model is easy to understand intuitively. When preys are plentiful and predators have little competition, their population can increase quickly. When there are too many predators, they eat all the prey and the prey population declines. Then the predators starve and their population goes down. Then the prey can again recover and the cycle restarts again. 
This is what we observe here. This graph shows the catches by trappers of lynx and hares in Canada around 1900. When the population of hares is high, the population of lynx increases quickly. Then the population of hares starts to decline because too many lynx eat them. Then the lynx have no food, air, and their number starts to dwindle. This model is obviously a differential equation system. For those who don't know, a system of differential equation occurs when the derivative of the variables of the system depends on the level of these variables. This is what's happening here. The growth rate of the hair population depends negatively on the stock of lynx, and the growth rate of the lynx population de de depends positively on the stock of hairs. Naturally, in the Easter Island model, the predators are the Polynesians and uh, the prey are the trees or nature in general. Let's now set up the model. We model the whole economy. It's thus a general equilibrium model where all markets are described. Islanders produce two goods, harvests and other goods. HT is the quantity of harvest of renewable resources, so food, at time t. And MT is some aggregate of other food, of other, food, of other good. It includes uh, tools, housing, artistic production, so of course Moai construction, and household production. The technology will be different in each market. In the food market, as we've seen before, production is proportional to the stock of resources, ST, and the labor used to harvest, L sub HT. We will write it HT equals alpha ST L HT. As previously mentioned, Alpha is the efficiency of farming in the farming technology. The technology used in the other good sector can just be linear. One worker in that sector produces one unit of good M. So we can just write M of T equals L sub M of T. The total available labor is simply the sum of labor used in every sector. This is going to be crucial to define our budget constraint. So it is simply that L sub H T plus L sub M T equals L of T. In the following slide, I will show two equivalent approaches to solve the problem that are equally, equally valid. They give exactly the same result. The first one is the simplest, and the second one is the one used by Brander and Taylor. My goal here is to uh, provide you with some insight as to how economists think about modeling. You may also say that what I'm showing you is how the economic sausage is done. To make our lives simple, we often take a shortcut and assume that there is a single agent in our model. It may look like an oversimplification for you, but if we don't necessarily need heterogeneity or interactions in a model, then this can be perfectly acceptable. So let's assume that our single representative islander has a cup de glass utility. This is the simplest to use. We will write the utility U of H M equals to H T to the beta M T to the one minus beta. Note that this single agent will have to produce everything by himself. He will have to spend some time in both sectors of the economy and the labor output will actually be the total output of the island. So the budget constraint is that he has to distribute his time between working in the agricultural sector and in the other sector. Using our previous formula, 
we can create a budget constraint by injecting the technologies uh, in the labor budget constraint. So our two technologies were HT equals alpha ST LHT and MT equals LMT. So uh, then uh, we can add them to the budget constraint LHT plus LMT equals LT. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, we can just uh, rewrite LHT as HT divided by alpha ST and LMT equals to MT. And then we just inject them in the budget constraint. And uh, after substitution, we get that uh, HHT divided by alpha ST plus MT equals LT. So what we just did there is to redefine the budget constraint, not in terms of how much labor can I supply, but then how much good can I obtain by supplying that labor. Uh, we could maximize the utility under constraint, but let's go ahead and make our lives even simpler. Since MT uh, enters just linearly in the budget constraint, we can uh, simply uh, substitute it. So we can rewrite MT equals to LT minus HT divided by alpha ST. And thus we get the utility U of HT MT equals to HT to the beta multiplied by, in parentheses, LT minus HT divided by alpha ST, everything to the power 1 minus beta. Now simply define the Islander problem as utility max maximization problem with respect to a single variable of choice, HT. So we write the problem, max HT, uh, choosing HT, uh, HT to the beta, LT minus HT divided by alpha ST to the 1 minus beta. And we can take the first order condition with respect to HT. So it's going to be a long one, but uh, don't worry, it's uh, nothing complicated. So if I uh, de derive with respect to the first HT, I get beta HT to the beta minus 1 multiplied by the parenthesis. And then I can derive with respect to the second HT inside the parenthesis and get so plus HT to the beta, 1 minus beta times the parenthesis LT minus HT divided by alpha ST to the minus beta. And then uh, by the chain rule, I differentiate with uh, inside the parenthesis with respect to HT and get minus 1 over alpha ST. And all of that has to equal zero for the uh, first order condition. Now, I will spare you the detail of the whole computation. Just trust me on this, but I highly recommend you to uh, try it yourself. It's uh, very good. So if you do so, you will find that uh, we obtain the first harvesting function we had earlier. HT equals alpha, beta, ST, LT. All right, so how can we interpret this? So beta is actually the preference of the islander for food. So it's natural to observe that if he likes food more in his utility function, then he's ready to spend more time harvesting for food. So beta is higher. And uh, alpha here actually represents not only the productivity of the harvesting, but the relative productivity of harvesting. Uh, compared to the technology of the other good, which was just similar. We could have had some technology of the other good too with some productivity, but in the end, it wouldn't have changed anything to the model. So we can just uh, leave, it, uh, uh, leave it out. Uh, so that was the representative Islander approach. It's simple, it's effective, but uh, let me give you an advice. If you want to publish in a good journal like the American Economic Review uh, one day, then just doing that is simply not enough. It doesn't cut it. 
So let me go ahead and uh, show you uh, how we can make our lives more difficult with the next approach.